Well, if you've been with us on Wednesday night, tonight is the third part of a four-part series on the life of prayer. And um, I mentioned, I think I gave a little teaser last week. I wasn't sure where I was going to land tonight, but the Lord did direct me, especially after pastor's message on Sunday, um, to deal with this issue of crying out in prayer, crying out to God in prayer. Um, I happened to run across this book of my dad's. It's called The Power of Crying Out When Prayer Becomes Mighty. And um, it is just... It's just as outlined and highlighted as his Bible was. And I know that he prayed this way uh, because you didn't pray with my dad without him praying out loud. And it didn't matter where you were. If you were in a restaurant, if you were at a ball game, if you were in the middle of the living room and your family, it didn't matter. That's how we grew up praying in our family. My aunt and uncle were missionaries to Guatemala, and I believe the only way they knew how to pray was loud. I don't think they've said a silent prayer in their entire life. Um, and that's good, but I'm not talking about a style of prayer tonight, okay? I'm talking about the power of crying out to our God who created us and loves us, and it's based in relationship. So let me just knock away some of the thoughts that we run to. It, this is not a doctrine of the church. We, we don't have the, the cry aloud and spare not doctrine um, where this is the only right way to pray. Um, you're not a second class Christian if you don't pray out loud. Uh, that, those, that's not where we're going with this tonight. But I do want to show you the pattern of Scripture, the biblical pattern, Old Testament and New Testament, of believers crying aloud to God in prayer and how he would then answer them according to those prayers cried out to him. But I want to read you a um, Story. This account appeared in the Dallas Morning News on October 28, 2001 in an article titled, Gunman Faces Off with Prayer's Power. And this column is by Steve Blow. And I, I got this off the internet. Like, it's connected to the um, Dallas Morning News. So this is not a spoof. And I did all my research. This is, this is legit. This is real. Sherman Jackson was a little late for the Sherry service. I, I think they meant testimony service, but this is a secular writer trying to uh, write this. The share service at his church on a recent Sunday night, but that was okay. He had quite a story to share once he got there. Sherman, age 36, and his seven-year-old daughter, Alexa, had stopped for gas on their way to church. This was on Northwest Highway where Garland and Mesquite and Dallas all meet. As they were about to drive away, a 30-ish fellow walked up. Hey, man, I need your help, he said. Could you please help me jumpstart my car? I'll pay you to help me. Sherman fretted a moment about being late for church. Then he chided himself for thinking of that over helping someone, so he invited the fellow to get in the front seat. Alexa was in the back, and they drove off. They hadn't gone far when the man reached into his pocket. I thought he was trying to get out some change to pay me for helping him, Sherman said. But no, he pulled out a revolver with his right hand and placed his left hand on my shoulder. He pointed the revolver into my rib cage and said, okay, man, this is for real. You give me all of your money right now or I'm going to unload this gun on you. Sherman was terrified, of course, and mad at himself for putting his daughter in danger. Okay, look. Here's all I have on me, he said, pulling out his money clip. Take it all. But the robber didn't believe him. That's not all. Give it all to me, he said, shoving the gun harder into Sherman's ribs. Sherman, a Garland insurance agent, keeps Gideon Bibles in his car with a dollar bill tucked in each one. He gives them to the homeless. The gunman spotted one of those bills sticking out of one of the Bibles and began to scream at Sherman. You lied to me. There is more money here. Something came over Sherman just then, and he began to pray out loud. Father in heaven, hear my cry and deliver me from this present evil. He felt a sudden calm. I lost all consciousness of concern and worry, he said. A boldness took over. He slowed the car and began to make a U-turn. The gunman screamed, what are you doing? This car is being turned around, Sherman replied, and I'm not taking orders from you anymore. The man put the gun against Sherman's chest. You don't get it, man. You mean nothing to me. I'll pull this trigger. 
No, you don't understand, Sherman cut him off. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. My Jesus is stronger than your gun. He could see the gunman tug on the trigger. The hammer drew back, but Sherman didn't flinch. He pulled over and stopped. I want to tell you about Jesus, he said to the gunman. The man wavered a moment, lowered his gun, and then dropped his head. When he looked up, he was crying. I'm so sorry, man. I'm so sorry, he said. I was going to shoot you. Don't worry about it. I forgive you, Sherman said. And then he began to tell the man about new life through belief in Jesus. Sherman urged the man to go on to church with him, but he declined. He asked Sherman to drive him to his car at a store. Along the way, the man began to tell Sherman about all his problems. He said his name was Mike and reached out to shake Sherman's hand. Sherman continued talking to him about starting life anew with God. As they neared the grocery store, Sherman said, And by the way, Mike, I want my money clip back. Do what? Mike exclaimed. But then he meekly handed it over. And Sherman went on, You're keeping this New Testament, and you're going to read it like you've never read anything else before. And I'm going to be praying for you, Mike, that God will come into your life. They pulled alongside Mike's car. He got out, Sherman said, with the revolver in one hand, the Bible in the other hand, and tears in his eyes. And Sherman drove on to church. This, to me, hits at home. On the power of prayer in the moment of crying aloud to our Father. So I want to spend some time tonight. We've talked about uh, the first Wednesday night how to set ourselves up for success in living a life of prayer. Not just the obligation of prayer or a lifestyle of prayer that might be a trend that comes and goes whenever we feel like it, but a life of prayer where we're grounded in a relationship with God, where we're growing with him and in him, and he is maturing us and building character in us that helps us to withstand the long haul. And then last week, we talked about Jesus' pattern of prayer that he taught the disciples and how he lived it out when he prayed. We, we looked at um, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, and then we looked at Jesus' prayer for the church in John 17, and we saw how he hit on every one of those points. So he was practicing what he preached. And tonight, I felt like the Lord lead me to talk through the, the biblical pattern of the power of crying out. Throughout scripture, believers are instructed to cry out to God in times of trouble. Here are just a few examples. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Jeremiah 33, 3. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Psalm 34, 17. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me, Psalm 56, 9. Throughout history, believers have cried out to God in times of distress. Sometimes after years of praying, a single cry brings direction or deliverance instantly. Many have wondered why there are such powerful results from simply crying out to God. Yet the word of God is very clear on this matter. Psalm 50, 15 says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. So tonight we're simply going to look at the biblical pattern of crying out. What are some characteristics of what it looks like and means to cry out? And then how does God respond when we cry out to him in prayer? And if we have time, I'd like to do a little lab at the end. We'll go ahead and dismiss. It won't be recorded. They'll shut that off. And then I'll tell you how we'll pray at the end tonight. But let's start tonight by looking at the biblical pattern of crying out. The following Hebrew and Greek words, their definitions and the descriptions of how they are used in Scripture help us to see and understand this biblical pattern that emerges. I've noticed as I've read through the Bible, I've been doing the um, McShane one-year Bible plan that R.T. Kendall has read for 45 years He's read through the Bible every year, 45 years through this same plan. I'm on year five. I may not hit 45 in time, but um, I got started a little late because I didn't know about it. But that's no excuse. I know about it now, so I'm doing it now. And I've noticed as I've read the word in this Bible plan that I'm reading through that this crying aloud comes up a lot. I've noticed it more 
than if I've just read a story or a segment or another Bible plan. I don't know why that is. I don't know if the Lord is uh, revealing something to his church in this season, in this era of church life and, and ministry. Um, but I've started to notice that. In fact, I was reading in Samuel the other morning and there was this phrase and they cried out to the Lord and Samuel cried out to the Lord. And I was like, wow. But let's look at the biblical pattern of crying out. Look at these Hebrew words. Nehemiah 9, 9 through 11 says, you saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry, Zaak, at the Red Sea, and you divided the sea before them. So they passed through it on dry ground. And let me say this, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a good sampling of, of the scripture. So you get an idea that it's in the scripture. If I were to list all of them, it would probably be over a thousand scripture references with the uh, phrase cry out or call to me or some kind of crying aloud to the Lord. But I, I just wanted to give us a, a biblical basis here tonight to start with. And again, this is not a doctrine. It's a biblical pattern that I think we can draw principles from and we can apply it to our lives. It's like the armor of God. And then we've got tools that supplement the armor of God. We've got crying aloud. We've got pleading the blood of Jesus. These are not Bible doctrines. These are just tools that we can use as Christians when we pray. Letter B, to cry out for help, sa'ak. When the Israelites in Exodus 15, 25 could not find fresh water in the wilderness, Moses cried Sa'ak unto the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Remember those bitter waters and they, they couldn't drink it because it was undrinkable. So what did Moses do in probably in frustration? It's like, Lord, I got all this water that we can't use and all these people who are very thirsty. So he cried out to God, God, help me. And God showed him the tree. He said, put this in the water and they can drink it. Letter C, to call with a loud sound, kara. Now, if you are a Hebrew scholar in here, please don't come up to me afterwards and tell me that I pronounced all these words wrong. I probably have already pronounced all of them wrong and will continue to do so. And it's because I'm not a Hebrew scholar and I know that. I'm just telling you what I found in my study and I hope it'll be encouraging to you. To call with a loud sound, Kara. Jabez called Kara on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed. And God granted him that which he requested. We see that in 1 Chronicles 4.10. There's also Ruah, to shout a war cry. Then the men of Judah gave a shout, Ruah. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel. Letter E, a cry for help, Shavah. This is Hebrew. In Psalm 145, 19, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry. He hears their Shavah and saves them. Letter F, a cry of deep distress, sa'aka, he does not ignore the cries or the sa'aka of the afflicted found in Psalm 912. Now we get into some Greek words here in the New Testament. To cry out, kradzo is Greek. When the apostle Peter walked out on the water at the invitation of Jesus, Peter was afraid and beginning to sink. He kradzoed saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Matthew's gospel 14 verses 30 to 31. And then letter H, to implore with a strong voice. Bao, Greek, a blind man in Jericho heard that Jesus was passing near him. And he baoed saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Found in Luke's gospel, 18, 38 to 42. Now, you and I have to understand something about the culture of this day. They were not afraid to voice their opinion. They were not afraid to talk loudly. And I think we have become westernized, civilized. I say that in quotes. Um, we've been made to be more demure and more thoughtful and more laid back and I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that's the culture we find ourselves in. So think about it. In their culture, crying aloud to God was easy because that's who they were and what they did in their culture. 
But guess what? It's still powerful even in our culture, even though that's not the way we are. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? We don't need to be locked in a culture and deny the power of God in things he wants to use in and through us. So we, we don't buy into what everyone else is doing and hope that we see some different results is what I'm saying. So it's going to be a little bit harder for us, especially those of you who did not grow up in a home where people prayed aloud. Now, can I just say that this really requires humility to cry aloud to God? You would think counterintuitively be opposite. Well, I've got a lot of pride and arrogance, so I cry aloud to God. No, it does the exact opposite. When we have pride and arrogance in our heart, it makes us not want to cry aloud. We want to keep our, you know, our cool and we don't want anybody to know our business. And, you know, this isn't, this isn't for them. This is a quiet, private thing between me and God. I understand that. But I think that is what the enemy is using at times to hold us back from seeing victory in areas where we could see victory and we could see results of the kingdom. But we've just held back and said, well, Lord, you know, my little silent prayer. Okay. Now I'm not asking anyone in here to change their personality. That's why this isn't a doctrine. This is just a biblical pattern. And I know that some of you in here are more quiet than others. And it would terrify you if I made you get up here in front of everybody and cry aloud to God and lead us in prayer. I'm not going to ask you to do that tonight, but I am going to ask you to do this. As we read through these passages of scripture, as we see the illustrations brought forth from the word of God, I want you to begin to ask the Lord, how do you want me to pray to you? It might be in the secret place, in the prayer closet, no one else has to be around. It's just you and God. It might be when all the kids and your husband's at work and nobody's home but you, you can cry aloud to God. I'm not saying you have to do it in public. I'm just saying there may be opportunities where the Lord will show you this is a time and a place when I want you to cry aloud to me because I want to answer in some amazing ways. So let's look at some characteristics of crying out. Crying out to God is an act of desperation and total concentration. You've heard that phrase, desperate times call for desperate measures. It is a fervent expression of faith in God and trust in his goodness and power to act on our behalf. We're, we're not going, hey God, watch me do this. We're going, Lord, I'm in over my head. I need you to do this. I cannot do this. If I try to do this, I'm sunk and everybody that's with me is going down. So we're acknowledging who God is and we're, it's a fervent expression of faith in God and trust in his goodness and his power to act on our behalf. Crying out to God expresses these following traits. I touched on this a little bit, but letter A, genuine humility. It's hard for people to admit that they cannot solve a problem or overcome an obstacle um, a lot of us want people to think we got our act together. We're self-sufficient. We're strong enough. We're smart enough. We can figure it out. Just give me some time. And can I tell you, brothers and sisters, on some issues in our life, we could have all the time in the world, but we will never figure it out because it's not an us figuring it out issue. It's a us humbling ourselves and saying, God, show me what you want to accomplish in and through this. Does that make sense? So it has to come from genuine humility. He delights, our Father, our God delights in a broken and a contrite heart that humbly seeks his aid. God is not put off by our request. He already knows we need him. He created us to need him. I think God laughs at us when we're like, I got this, God. Let me show you what I'm doing about this. I think he giggles. I think he's like, you're in trouble. You're in over your head. This is not going to work. He's waiting for us in humility to surrender and say, help me. We seek his aid and his help. Psalm 912 says he forgets not the cry of the humble. I'm so glad of that. He doesn't forget our cries. We come to him in humility. And guess what? He'll hear it and he won't forget it. 
He'll keep coming to our aid. So genuine humility is a characteristic of crying out. Letter B, unconditional surrender is also a characteristic of crying out. Why? Because when you and I surrender without conditions, that means we have said, ultimately, God, you're in control and I trust you. So many times you and I, and I'm including myself in this, let me, let me put me first, I and you, because I'm probably worst at this. I know that's not good grammar, but I'm trying to drive a point home here. Sometimes I and you want to have conditional surrender. Well, Lord, I'll, I'll surrender this if you'll do this. He's not interested in you surrendering this. He's interested in you surrendering it all. Your all and my all. That is what he's after. From the moment we say yes to Jesus, from the moment we open our heart to the eternal King of kings and Lord of lords, he is wanting full and complete surrender. So when a situation becomes so desperate that only God can deliver us, a cry represents total, unconditional surrender. It's like a baby that's hungry or tired and they really can't do anything for themselves. They're a newborn infant and they are relying on that mom or that dad to come to their aid. So what do they do? They don't say, Father, I believe it is supper time and I would like a snack. No. Wah! They cry because they don't know how to verbalize what they're feeling or thinking, but they know if I can get mama or daddy's attention, they'll figure it out and they'll give me what I need. That is the level of unconditional surrender that our father wants from us. Don't try to bargain with God. That's that conditional surrender I was talking about. Leave your life totally in his hands. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. And what's that? That's that conditional surrender. I'll, I'll give you this part, Lord. Or I'll, give, well, I'll give you this part, this part, and this part, but I'm keeping this part. He wants total surrender. Letter C, a plea for mercy. Apart from Christ, we have no value that merits God's favor. Until we understand this, we will never grasp the mess we're in. Because we think... And pastor has said this many times. We're like, hey, God, you're pretty lucky to have me on your team. I'm pretty sure I brought some stuff with me when you brought me in the family. No, we are totally broken. We are totally bankrupt. And we are pleading to God for mercy. When driven to a point of despair or destruction, your unworthiness before God and my unworthiness before God becomes more apparent and it motivates us to cry out to him for mercy. Lord, I know how broken I am. Why have you put me in this place of leadership or service or in this place of mentoring or accountability? I'm, so, I'm more broken than the person I'm trying to help and that you're sending me to help. But that's a motivation for us to cry out to him. Lamentations 3 says it's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning and his faithfulness is great. Letter D, personal helplessness. Do you tend to believe that you need God's help with only the really hard things? Remember Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do some things. No, you can do no things or nothing. We forget that, don't we? We're like, okay, God, I'll handle these five small things if you'll help me with these three big things. And he's like, you don't understand the benefit that awaits you. I'll help you with all eight of them if you'll just totally surrender and cry out to me and realize how helpless you are without me. Letter E, faith in God's power and resources. Our cry to God acknowledges God's ability to do what no one else can do. During the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the disciples acknowledged Jesus' power to rescue them when they cried out, Lord, save us, we perish. So that crying aloud meant, I don't have the power or the resources to figure this out or to make this change. Only 
God does. Only Jesus does. So that cry, that prayer of crying out to God helps us to see that it's his power and his resources that we need in those moments. And then there's that word we've said a couple times already tonight, desperation, letter F. Crying out to God is an admission of my need for him. It's an admission of your need for him. The psalmist declared in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Think of the holiest place on earth, the temple of God with the outer court, inner court and holy of holies. And yet he allows our cry to enter the holiest place where he resided while on earth. And he said, I hear it and I'm going to answer it. I hear your desperation. I see your desperation and I'm enough for you. I will come to your aid. Now, what's God's response to crying out? I'm so glad he responds to us in our frailty and in our inconsistency and in our being overwhelmed. The Bible is filled with examples of times when God answered the cries of his people. Here are some examples of occasions where individuals cried out to God and God heard their cries and delivered them. Elijah cried out, we know this story, and God revived a dead child. A child of promise to a woman who had asked, give me a son, give me a child. The child came, then the child died. And then Elijah cried out to the Lord in verse 20 of 1 Kings 17. Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord. Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. You see that exclamation point. He didn't go, Lord, if you're there and can hear me, please heal this boy. Amen. No. Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. The Lord is not hard of hearing. He's not hard of hearing. He doesn't need us to shout so he can hear us above everybody else. It is an act of faith and desperation on our part. We're not impressing him. We're not twisting his arm. We're just following that biblical pattern. And it does get his attention and it does touch his heart. And he does respond in a way that is miraculous and beyond what we could ask or think. Let her be Jehoshaphat cried out and God delivered him from death. When the chariot commander saw Jehoshaphat, they thought this is the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him, but Jehoshaphat cried out and the Lord helped him. God drew them away from him. Hezekiah cried out and God gave him victory. In 2 Chronicles 32, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and commanders and officers in the camp of the enemy Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with the sword. So Hezekiah had a major victory because he cried out to God. Letter D, Jesus' disciples cried out to him in a storm, and Jesus calmed the sea. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. They went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. And then blind Bartimaeus called to Jesus, and he restored his sight. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with the disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And we heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. This is what the enemy does to us today. Shh, keep it down. Nobody wants you to make a, a ruckus. Why are you causing trouble? Shh. 
The same thing that happened physically back then happens spiritually today. The enemy wants to silence our cry out to the Lord. But he cried out all the more. I love his response. He didn't go, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to um, break the social mores of the day and be out of, be out of control. No, he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. He's calling you, throwing off his cloak. He sprang up, ran to Jesus. Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Well, we're wrapping it up pretty quickly. But I want to encourage you tonight that you and I can cry out to the Lord for power in holy and righteous living. We can cry out to the Lord for understanding and counsel. We can cry out to the Lord for self-control. We can cry out to the Lord for faith We can cry out to him for spiritual victory, for blessing and provision, for healing, for deliverance from demonic oppression, and for quenching our spiritual thirst. Whatever you have need of, whatever wall or barrier you're hitting your head into every day, you can cry out to the Lord and ask for his help, and he will answer because he's good. I had a situation about five years ago where I had to cry out to the Lord. Um, I had been in a minor fender bender. Uh, It was a sunny August summer afternoon, flash rainstorm, floods the streets with all the gas and oil and makes it very slick on dry tires. And so I hydroplaned into the rear end of a vehicle in front of me on Elmwood Avenue downtown. And I mean, barely tapped the bumper. I mean, just... But the two cars made contact. So in the pouring down rain, I get out of my car, turn on my hazards, go and check, make sure the driver is okay, their situation. I said, we've had a little accident here. We probably should pull over and, you know, at least have a police officer come and write a report. That way we've got a report that something happened and it's not just your word and my word. We have a third party authority. They're like, that's fine. So we pull into that BP gas station there on Elmwood Avenue and we're under the the awning. And I felt bad because we weren't buying any gas. We were just using the overhead, you know, to keep us dry. And I I saw, uh, I called several police agencies. I called 911. They're like, you need to just call the local sheriff. Don't type the 911 line. I'm like, okay, sorry. And because I was flustered. And so I found a police car sitting in the McDonald's parking lot on on Elmwood Avenue. And I walk over to it and this... um, young African-American woman police officer. I walked up to the car like this because that's not a great area of town and I didn't want her to think I was doing anything funny. So I just walked up to the car like this and she acknowledged me and I put my hands down. I said, there's been a little fender bender. Would you mind coming and writing a report for us when you get finished with whatever you're doing? She said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. So I go and begin to talk to the gentleman um, under the overhang and found out he had come to our church. And I was like, well, wonderful. That's great. So he started calling me pastor and his son was in our ranger program on Wednesday night. And, um, we have a large church so I could, I could meet a number of people and not know who they are, you know, in public somewhere. And, um, he, he didn't look familiar to me, but we were talking and, and everything seemed to be fine. We took pictures. There was no damage on either vehicle. And, um, the police officer wrote a report and gave us both copies and we said our goodbyes. And he said, Pastor, before you go, would you just be praying? Because my neck is really starting to hurt really bad. And I thought, oh, Jesus, this is not going to be good. <laughs> and so sure enough, um, about a week or so later, um, he hired an attorney and tried to sue me for the uh, full coverage comprehension on like the full extent of my, of my car insurance coverage. Um, and it was just, I was like, what is going on here? We, I'm the one that did the right thing. I went and got the cop. We had the report. I pursued all that cause I wanted it done right. And now he suing me and I didn't know this cause I've never had to deal with anything like this, but anything someone is awarded in a court case 
that's above what your insurance covers, you're liable for. It comes out of your pocket. So if they won a $500,000 lawsuit against me and my insurance only went up to $300,000, I'm on the hook for $200,000. I don't have $200,000. I don't have $200. So I'm just like, Lord, what's going on? What do I do? And um, I had to be, they had to depose me. I had to give a statement over the phone. They got a subpoena for my phone records to make sure I wasn't on my phone texting or calling at the time of the accident. I mean, this was a big deal. And I'm like, what is going on? I was just on my way to the hospital to pray with somebody before their surgery that afternoon. And so the enemy starts working in all this stuff, you know, playing mind games. And so I just got to the point where I was like, Lord, I, had, I pulled a Hezekiah moment, Hezekiah's story in 2 Kings 19, 14. I got the summons for the lawsuit and all that from the attorney. And I just, I, I brought it here to the church and I just laid it out on the altar. And I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I cannot do this. I don't have what it takes. You have got to protect me. You have got to cover this. Not a cover up. But you've got to cover whatever's coming because I don't know what's coming at this point. And a peace just came over me. And I, I was like, okay, Lord, it's yours. And I just gave it to him. And every time that I remember coming and laying it on the altar and praying over it, Pastor Stephen prayed over it with me. And finally, um, I had good insurance. They hired an attorney to represent me and everything was fine. And, and the gentleman was trying to have my insurance pay for a work injury that he had had about six months earlier and he'd been out of work because of it. So he's like, this is a good way I can try to get my hospital bills paid for. So they settled for a very, very low amount of money that I never saw or never had to pay anything. But it took about five years for that whole process. And so I've had to cry out to the Lord. And I'm sure you have too. And I'm sure it's been over much more than just a little insurance incident. But this is a weapon in our arsenal. This is a tool in our toolbox that we can use in prayer to cry out to the Lord. And so as we conclude tonight, I want to give you an invitation from the living God. Psalms 50, 15, which was our main passage tonight, declares the word from the Lord. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. As children of the living God, our heavenly Father appeals to us to cry out to him for deliverance. So I want to encourage you to join Old and New Testament believers and follow in their footsteps. They were known as people who cried out to the Lord all throughout Scripture. And I want you to take passages like Psalm 16 or Psalm 23 or Psalm 25, or 31, or 51, or 63, and just write out several verses from each of these psalms on three by five cards and pray them aloud to the Lord. Might be in your car, might be in your closet, might be in your bedroom, might be on your back porch, on your deck. It might be out in the woods. Um, I don't know where you'll cry out to the Lord, but I want to encourage you to begin to pray these and personalize each of these verses. I'll give those chapters to you again. Psalm 16, Psalm 23, Psalm 25, Psalm 31, Psalm 51, or you can use Psalm 63. And there's myriads more. I was just trying to give you something to start with. And begin to pray these scriptures aloud over your life, over your situation, over your family, over your marriage, several times a day over the course of the next week. And see if this will increase your concentration and fervency in prayer. Because we've got to start somewhere. Okay? We've got to start somewhere. What's that? Yep. Psalm 16. Psalm 23. Psalm 25. Psalm 31, Psalm 51, or Psalm 63. And, and you don't have to write out the whole chapter. Just find verses in those chapters that speak to your heart about the situation you're facing. Write those down and begin to pray those aloud. Don't just whisper, pray them. 
I'm not saying you have to pray in front of your family. We got to start somewhere. So it's just you and God. That's fine. But don't don't shrink back from something that God's given us. I believe this is a gift he's given us to be able to cry out to him. Just like a baby cries for his mom or dad. We can cry out to our father. We should cry out, Abba, Father. He's our dad. He loves us. He created us. And he wants to be involved in our lives. So I just want to ask if you'll pray with me and close. And then um, I've got something else I want to share with you very quickly before we leave. Father, thank you so much for this study tonight. Thank you for the gift that you've given us in crying aloud to you in prayer. Lord, I thank you that there's power in that because we are uh, weak as water. We are humble before you. Uh, we're trusting in you completely. Um, we, we don't have room or ability to negotiate with you. We just have to say, Lord, I cannot do this. I need your help. And Lord, I believe you will answer according to your power and according to your will. And we will see your mighty hand at work in ways that we never could have imagined because we didn't try. And Lord, again, praying quietly to ourselves, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not bad. It's not a sin. It's not wrong. But Lord, we're just adding another tool to our toolbox so that when desperate times call for desperate measures, we have the freedom to cry out to you and the enemy can't stop us or shut us up because that would be his favorite day if you had some answer waiting for us and we were silenced by fear of how we sounded or what we looked like or what other people thought of us. Father, forgive us for thinking that way, but help us to connect with your heart as we cry out in prayer. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know you, maybe their cry tonight is, Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. Save me. Make me your child. Cleanse me from evil and wickedness. Make me righteous and pure because of your son, Jesus. Father, if that's someone's prayer and cry out to you tonight, I pray that they would find someone that they trust. Maybe see me after church or one of their friends and say, I, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want him to be the one who calls the shots and makes the decisions. I want to learn to trust him and not myself and make it happen on my own anymore by my, by my own strength or intellect. Father, I thank you that you said you would give those eternal life that call on the name of the Lord. You said those that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we thank you that that promise can even be fulfilled tonight for those crying out to you. Lord, bless us as we go. And even as we cry aloud in prayer, these different Psalms, passages, and scriptures, Lord, let something begin to stir up in our hearts. Even as we're going into this season of prayer and fasting for 21 days as a church, Lord, let this be a, a catapult or a catalyst of drawing closer to you and hearing your heart and your thoughts more clearly than ever before. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.